Great. Thank you so much, Miles. Uh, so I live here in Hancock, New Hampshire, uh, southwestern part of the state. Uh, nestled in the Monadnock region. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts um, and started my college in northern Vermont uh, and then moved to Antioch University uh, here in Keene, New Hampshire to study golden-winged and blue-winged warblers uh, for my master's thesis. And from there I started to tackle all things bird-related um, and I'm really really excited to present part of my passion to you tonight uh, which is feeding birds and how can we attract birds to our yards especially during a cold cold winter. Wonderful. So welcome. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about winter bird feeding. Uh, we can feed birds year round, but it's best during the winter uh, when bears are hibernating uh, and there's fewer animals out there that also want to eat our bird seed that we put out for birds. So we have a lot of things to cover tonight. Um, I'm going to take a fairly high level pass at all of these topics. Of course, there's a lot more information out there and I encourage you to do some of your own research online or pick up a book uh, at your local bookstore. Tonight, we'll talk about why feed birds, why it's beneficial, uh, what kinds of food can we put out for birds? What kinds of feeders are there? There's hundreds of kinds. I'm going to break them into a couple main categories and what types of food you can put in each of them. Um, a couple tips on feeder cleaning, which is very, very important, um, and placement. A lot of times people will grab a feeder and just put it up in their yard uh, without thinking too much about, well, can a squirrel actually jump that far? Turns out squirrels can jump a lot farther than we think we can, than we think they can. So I'll talk a little bit more about the art of squirrel proofing, which isn't an exact science, um, but hopefully you can all have fun trying out new things. Um, a couple other considerations for attracting birds to your yard, uh, and then all of your sightings matter, so how can you share your bird observations with science? I'll give you a couple projects that are really easy to get involved with. So let's start right off. Um, during the winter, it's cold out. And if you saw my last presentation, we talked about how birds are staying warm during these chilly months. Um, part of that, part of the method that they used to stay warm is finding food and eating it and burning those calories to generate heat. Um, but during the winter, food is often more difficult to find. It's not impossible. Uh, we humans, if we went out on the winter landscape, we'd say, there's no food out and about. But birds have evolved over millions of years to find Difficultly, uh, difficult to find resources during the winter. It could be something tucked in a rolled up leaf or buried in a thin layer of snow or tucked in a crevice of tree bark. So birds are well adapted to finding food during the winter, but it's still difficult for them and they're burning more calories to stay warm. Additionally, our bird feeding um, it supplements these natural food resources that are already out there on the landscape. So during a particular cold spell or during a blizzard or just after a blizzard, these birds need calories. Perhaps all the food that they cached is now buried by snow. And bird feeding can help them get through those especially hard times. Uh, so it's a supplemental food resource. It's, not, it's never their main source of food during the winter. So it's good for birds and as humans, it makes our days much more enjoyable. When we see the flash of red when a northern cardinal goes by, uh, or the twitters of dark-eyed juncos down on the ground. So as, as a human, as a bird watcher, I love bringing birds to my yard uh, to see what they're all about. And science demonstrates that watching birds helps reduce stress, anxiety, and depression. So some of us might suffer from seasonal uh, depression during the winter. The sun isn't out as much, especially during cloudy spells. And so bringing birds to our yard literally brightens up our day and our moods. So double thumbs up for bringing birds to our yards. So there's a lot of options out there. I'm going to tell you a couple of the best ones, some of my personal favorites for what to feed your food. So from acorns to zucchinis, there's a lot of possibilities. I'm going to focus more on bird seeds uh, and a couple other options. Uh, so the first six that are listed here, black oil sunflower seed, striped sunflower peanuts, niger or thistle seed. These are really, really good ones. The ones with the red circles and the line going through it. These are generally not preferred by birds and they'll just toss them to the ground and focus on these first six. So when you're out shopping for bird, for bird seed, it can be a little overwhelming if you haven't done it before. There's lots of options out there. Most 
bird seed bags uh, will have a little helpful chart on the back that tells you which species or which groups of birds prefer different kinds of foods. But these charts themselves can also be complicated if you've never looked at one before. So I like this one. It breaks it down into groups of birds and what type of food is preferred versus readily eaten. So chickadees, titmice, and nuthatches love sunflower seeds as well as finches, cardinals, sparrows. You get the gist. Sunflower seeds are a favorite food for many different birds. But then you go down to Milo seed or Niger seed, and it's really only going to benefit one, maybe two groups of birds. So it can be very helpful uh, before you start feeding birds to figure out what birds are in your area. Um, do you have black capped chickadees or red bellied woodpeckers? Uh, figure out what birds are possible that could be attracted to your yard, and then identify a couple of groups of birds that you would like to attract to your yard. So say, well, I already get plenty of chickadees and finches and cardinals at my feeders, but what could I do to bring in more woodpeckers or orioles? Not so much during the winter here in New England, maybe down in Georgia or Texas, um, but orioles would be more summer months here in New England. Pigeons and doves as well as another group. Um, Many of us don't like to get rock pigeons at our feeders. If you live in an urban or suburban area, we might prefer the native morning dove or, or, um, or white winged dove if you happen to be out west. So I, li I love to start talking about uh, sunflower seeds. It's my number one choice, particularly the black oil sunflower seed. Here's why. Sunflowers come in several varieties. So the black oil that I just mentioned, uh, there's also striped sunflower seeds and you can get either of these um, as hulled as hulled seeds. So those are the ones without the shells. It's a little more expensive because they have to get processed. The, sheet, the, the shells have to get taken off, um, but there's less of a mess under your bird feeders come springtime. Uh, you don't have to rake away two or three inches of bird seed shells uh, if you get the previously shelled seeds. So something to keep in mind. Um, the black oil sunflower seeds are preferred um, by many, many birds, chickadees, titmice, nuthatches, cardinals, grosbeaks, doves, sparrows, um, pigeons, even woodpeckers will eat the black oil sunflower seeds. These have a, a thinner shell, uh, which enables the smaller birds like chickadees and nuthatches to break through the shell, uh, whereas the striped sunflower seed has a thicker shell, and so you'll see chickadees avoiding the thick thick shelled seeds, um, but the jays and cardinals can still use their bigger beaks to break through uh, the thick shell of the striped sunflower seed. Sunflower seeds in general fit a lot of the common feeder types. So if you already have feeders and you aren't using sunflower seeds, it'd be an easy transition for you to move to them. And like I said, it's a go-to favorite for birds and for humans. Uh, the next one I, I cover is millet seed. There's two kinds. There's red and white. White tends to be more popular than red, except for a handful of species that live in the southwest part of the United States. So if you're looking for seed mixes, um, aim for ones that have more white millet seed uh, than the red millet. Uh, so it's really common in mixtures. It's harder to find as a standalone seed, uh, but birds still enjoy it. It's especially sparrows, blackbirds, and doves. Um, so I think Lisa had the brown-headed cowbird still at her feeder this winter. Um, that's a type of blackbird, and they might enjoy some white millet if you have that or, or want to put that out for it. Um, sparrows and doves are more ground feeders. You could scatter this on the ground uh, to attract those species, which may not come up onto a tube feeder or a platform feeder. Uh, and this one also fits a lot of the common feeder types. The next seed is safflower seed. Uh, it's really common in mixes. You can get it as a standalone seed. Um, you can get it with or without shells. I like to get it without shells. Uh, it's good for most songbirds. It's not as popular as the black oil sunflower seed, but it's still a good one. Uh, again, fits most feeder types, so it's a good all-around seed. And there's a theory out there amongst bird watchers that squirrels tend to dislike it. Uh, it might not be as flavorful for their taste buds, but there's no hard science behind this. So if any of you are feeding safflowers or if you have an entire feeder you could set aside for safflower seeds, um, 
do a little study in your own backyard and see are the squirrels avoiding it? Are they, you know, are they going after the other bird seeds? Um, so something that is a hypothesis out there, but it hasn't been tested too well yet. The next one that a lot of people like to buy, especially during the winter, is Niger seed. This is also known as thistle seed, and it's a very small, thin, black seed, um, and it has good protein and fat content. And these thin seeds are preferred by finches, including red poles, uh, as well as uh, some sparrows like juncos. Um, it doesn't fit in a lot of feeders. It will just pour out of those larger holes. And so the way to feed Niger seed to birds is to put it in specialized feeders. These typically have smaller holes or mesh so that the seeds don't come gushing out uh, and that uh, the finch uh, will insert its beak into one of these small holes and extract a seed, uh, take the shell off real quick, eat it and move on to another one. Peanuts, this is a favorite uh, for, for a lot of bird watchers out there. Uh, they're easy to find at the store. You can get them as either shelled peanuts or unshelled peanuts. Uh, again, larger birds and squirrels can go through the shells just fine, uh, but smaller birds will typically avoid the peanuts if they still have the shells on. Um, they're really great for attracting jays and woodpeckers. So here in the Northeast, we have the blue jay um, and many species of woodpeckers, downy woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers, pileated woodpeckers, red-bellied woodpeckers. Um, those are the main four. If you're up far north in New England or maybe even in, in northern Wisconsin, uh, you might get black-backed woodpeckers, uh, which would be a specialty. You'd have to be in boreal habitat, though. Um, these don't fit most other feeders, so you have to get a, a peanut feeder or put them out on your deck railing um, in order for birds to, to access them. One thing to keep in mind, though, is something called an aflatoxin. So this is uh, a liver toxin, and birds are um, especially harmed by this if it's present. And so um, if, if the peanuts are human grade, it's okay to put them out for birds. But beware of peanuts that might be livestock grade or lesser grades. Um, and these might contain enough of the aflatoxin um, that it could kill your birds. So just make sure you're getting human grade peanuts um, before you put them out for birds. Corn, so this is a popular one. If you've ever seen a flock of birds during migration season, especially during the fall, um, some of you might live near a snow goose migration corridor or sandhill cranes even, uh, they are flocking to agricultural fields where there's usually leftover or corn or other grains on the ground. Uh, sparrows are also attracted to corn as well. And so um, bird watchers have keyed into this uh, as well as people who make and sell bird seed um, because they know it will attract certain birds. So corn can either be bought as cracked corn or whole corn. Uh, that's the smaller image with the blue jay. It's great for sparrows, doves, and jays, um, but other birds will occasionally dine on it, especially if they've run out of black oil sunflower seed at, at your feeders. Um, I like to place this on the ground or in some sort of homemade mix. Um, I typically won't dedicate an entire bird feeder to corn, uh, to cracked corn, but I'll spread it on the ground for the sparrows and doves. And I might mix some into the feeder in smaller bites uh, where chickadees and jays could get at it easily. Um, another thing to keep in mind with corn, similar to peanuts, uh, is it is susceptible to mold. Uh, so just make sure you're getting high quality corn uh, from, a, from a reputable bird seed brand. And then of course there's seed mixtures. So we talked about all of these ingredients and seed types as standalone items, which is great. Um, but when you're searching for bird seed buying online or in the store, um, most of the bags you might see come in seed mixes. So this is a combination of multiple ingredients. And the photo on the right uh, will test your skills, which sort of uh, seeds can you identify? So think about it in your head for a couple seconds. There's about four, maybe five or six different kinds here. There's the striped sunflower seed. That's the big black and white one. And there's the white proso millet. That's the small uh, white round one. We see some cracked corn over here. Uh, there's some red millet mixed in. And this black seed is a, is a 
probably a rape seed or a canary seed. Um, these generally aren't preferred by birds. It's a, it's a filler seed used to fill up more volume in the bird seed bag and then the birds ignore it. Um, so when you're buying seed mixtures, make sure you're getting uh, that most of the volume in that bird seed bag is those high quality ingredients that we talked about. So there's countless blends out there. Usually there's some sort of label on the bag that indicates what kinds of birds are attracted. Um, so they can be customized for different bird groups and you can always make your own seed mixes uh, if you wanted to attract different species or try out different levels of or different ratios of black oil sunflower seed uh, to cracked corn or whatnot. Um, it does fit a lot of the common feeder types, which is handy. And so just avoid a lot of those filler seeds. So milo, wheat, and barley. These are generally discarded by birds and it just leaves a mess uh, on, your, on your deck or in your yard. And you end up paying for seeds that are not getting used. Um, so it's worth spending the extra uh, couple dollars or dozen dollars to get a higher quality bag uh, because there will be no waste from that. So now that you have all of these seeds I've just talked about, um, you need to store them properly. Um, uh, for a week or so earlier uh, in the winter, I had an issue with a chipmunk uh, getting into getting into my screened in porch and eating through the bird seed bag. So I went out and I bought um, a, a thick, tough plastic container to put to put the seeds in. So the goal here is to prevent the growth of mold. Um, and that's that that's um, created when there's moisture and heat typically. So store it in a cool, dry place uh, and make sure that no critters can get into it, like that my pesky little chipmunk or even squirrels or raccoons um, or bears, if you're storing your bird seed outside, can get into the, some of these containers. So keep it inside, uh, but not too difficult to access because you'll be filling up your bird feeders regularly, uh, but in a cool, dry location with a tight lid so nothing can get in there. So let's branch out from seeds and talk about suet. So this is rendered beef fat. All of the impurities have been taken out. Um, you, can, you can make it at home. You can pick up suet from a, a local uh, butcher shop uh, and then render it yourself at home and put out for birds. I typically buy it. Bird Feeders Choice is a good brand. Um, any of these big name brands have good quality suet with the impurities taken out. So there's a number of varieties. You can get plain suet, um, but I like to get ones with other treats mixed in. So black oil sunflower seed or cracked corn mixed into the suet um, and, and other seeds as well. It's really great for woodpeckers, insectivores. So we haven't talked much about these tonight. So these are birds that eat primarily insects like warblers. So most warblers migrate out of New England and Northern North America during the winter months. But if one sticks around, perhaps it's injured or something's wrong with its internal compass, um, it might come to your suet feeder. So actually right now, um, on the New Hampshire seacoast, I think there's a pine warbler, an orange crowned warbler, and a prairie warbler all hanging out on available food. Uh, sometimes it's suet feeders. So you never know what might come to your suet feeder. One of the best things about putting suet out is it's really high in fat. Now, for most of us humans, we enjoy eating carbohydrates, sugars. And carbohydrates have about four calories per gram, as well as proteins, but fat has nine calories per gram. And so it's a really energy dense um, uh, compound that's better for birds during winter. With less eating, they can get more calories to keep them warmer throughout the night. So fat is what a lot of birds are looking for during the winter. Protein is second best carbohydrates are third uh, and worst for birds. Their birds have evolved to burn protein and fats more efficiently than carbohydrates. Um, suet doesn't fit in most of your standard bird feeders. However, it's really easy to get or make a suet cage uh, from the store. They're maybe four or five dollars, so they're pretty cheap. Uh, get something that's vinyl or plastic covered wire typically. Um, and again, some corn and peanuts are susceptible to those aflatoxins. So make sure that if there are corn or peanuts mixed into your suet, make sure that they're human grade um, and not from a lesser source. Peanut butter is another favorite. Uh, some of you may already be doing this at your home feeder setups. Um, 
aim for unsalted peanut butter with few additives. So make sure there's not a lot of sugar. Try not to put out that jiffy peanut butter spread. Aim for something that's more of like unsalted Teddy's peanut butter. Um, something that doesn't have a lot of ingredients. Birds have evolved to eat these raw ingredients. Um, they're not built to digest corn, uh, high fructose corn syrup or things like that. Uh, peanut butter is great for nut hatches, woodpeckers, and jays, uh, and it can fit special peanut butter feeders like the one on the right with the Oriole and the chickadee, or you can stick it in any hole, slather it on a nearby tree, uh, but make sure you're not doing this when there's bears outside. So in New Hampshire, that means December 1st through April 1st is the best time to feed winter birds. Mealworms. These are uh, relatively more expensive. You can buy packages of them in the store. They come dead. Um, or some people prefer to grow these mealworms at home and just raise them. And then they can put out live uh, insects during the winter. So these are really great for more insectivores, uh, things like bluebirds or even late eastern phoebes if they're still sticking around. Um, Orioles as well will come in to, to mealworms, but other birds will eat them too. Uh, they're high in protein um, and they have some fat as well. These fit best in a platform or tray feeder um, and you can offer them dead or alive depending on your preference. So a couple no-nos when it comes to bird feeding. So house sparrows, they're an invasive species here in North America. We often see them near, uh, in parking lots, near grocery stores and restaurants. They're eating our scraps. Um, but this really isn't the healthiest food that birds could be eating. Uh, there's an old book, I think this was published in the 1970s, the Bird Feeder's Handbook. This is an accurate statement. Many birds will eat bread, donuts, and other plain baked goods, but they really shouldn't be because those have um, unnecessary ingredients that might not be the best for birds. I've also seen advertisements for bacon fat bird feeders. Do it yourself at home. Yes, birds will eat it, um, but bacon is often treated with nitrates or sodium, and those are extra ingredients that can cause a lot of internal harm and upset um, their chemical balance in their, in their digestive system, and, and it could lead to death uh, in some birds. And of course, crows, scavengers, it's their nature. Uh, if you are attracting crows to your bird feeders, make sure you're putting out healthy food. So here's a quick uh, summary of what not to put out for backyard birds. Um, try not to put out too much raw meat. It can spoil really easily, especially if the temperature warms up. Spoiled bird seed, we want to avoid that at all costs. Um, milk, cookies, bread, honey, chips, sugar, salt. Um, again, keeping those ingredients that we find very tasty, uh, but keeping them out of our bird food. Did you know Americans love feeding birds. We spend $4 billion each year on feeding birds and bird paraphernalia. Um, so there's a lot of bird houses and bird feeders out there for us to choose from. So there's a couple basic kinds that I've been hinting at already. Uh, the first one is a platform feeder. This is fairly simple. It has, um, it's either open air or it has some sort of closed covering. Uh, the ones on the right with those closed covering, I prefer. Uh, that helps keep out the rain, snow, and sleet during winter months. And I don't have to go out there every other day to make sure that the bird seed isn't getting too moldy. So it, it'll last a little longer with some sort of covering. Uh, they can hold a lot of different seeds, fruit, mealworms, other food, peanut butter, peanuts. Um, so there, this is an easy one to set up. <clears throat> the next one is a hopper feeder. Uh, if you don't like to go outside every day or every other day, get a high capacity hopper feeder. So these have a, a central um, hopper or chamber that stores a lot of bird seed. Um, and as the birds eat from the side trays, more seed is dispensed. And so this, I have one of these wild birds and limited feeders and I fill it up maybe uh, every week. Um, maybe two weeks if the birds are a little less busy. So this can hold a high volume of food. Um, and again, make sure it has some sort of cover to keep out that moisture to, uh, that'll help prevent the seeds from getting too moldy. Uh, there's many kinds. Some of them are combo feeders. So this has a central hopper with a cover and two side trays, as well as two suet feeders affixed to the sides. So you might get a little bit more bird diversity on that one. The next one is a tube feeder. Uh, this is what I recommend to beginner 
bird feeders. Uh, it's very simple to hang off of a deck or on a shepherd's hook uh, or elsewhere on your property. Um, they're versatile. They can be filled with many different kinds of bird food. You can get different sized ones, um, ones that have these exterior grates to keep out large birds or squirrels, theoretically. Um, and then other ones on the right that have cupboards and, and all sorts of trays and, and different amounts of perches. So there's a lot of different kinds of tube feeders, but it's a really simple one to maintain and they're easy to clean, which is something to keep in mind when you're purchasing feeders. Then, of course, there's the suet feeder, so some sort of wire cage encased uh, in plastic or vinyl uh, just to weatherproof it so that the, the, the metal isn't rusting onto the suet and impacting the birds. There's many different kinds. You can hang just one or put four out all at once. And then there's window feeders. These are really popular if you have children uh, or indoor pets. It can give them a lot of mental enrichment. Um, the, I have a, an indoor cat uh, and we don't let her outside, but she loves to watch the bird, the birds from inside. Um, and it keeps her from doing other naughty things around the house. So these are handy. You can suction cup them right to the house. Um, sometimes the birds will become accustomed to you walking by the window, um, or even if you stand there closely, you can get within just a couple inches uh, of the birds. So they usually don't hold a lot of, of uh, bird seed, but it does bring the birds closer to you than other feeder types. And then there's seed socks. These are best for Niger seed. They're not really used for, for anything else, uh, but they have these really thin holes that finches can stick um, their, their smaller bills into and extract those Niger or thistle seeds. So these are, are cheap, they're handy. I usually replace them every couple of years, just they get stiffened up. Um, and it, it, because they have those small holes, make sure you check them closely because uh, it's harder to see any mold or rotten seed within these bags. So try to replace the seed in them uh, every couple weeks maximum. So cleaning feeders, we've put out this great buffet for birds and it is our responsibility to make sure that we're not getting these birds sick or accidentally killing them. Uh, enough birds are dying as is. So how do we clean our bird feeders? Well. This needs to be done every two to four weeks minimum. Um, other sites say three to six months. I always err on the side of caution. Uh, there was that big scare in the mid-Atlantic states over the summer with that unknown bird disease going around. And we recommended take your feeders down uh, until we say it's okay. And so make sure you're cleaning those feeders. Otherwise it's easy, easier for birds to spread disease uh, from one feeder to the next. So two to four weeks minimum. If your feeders are really, really busy, some people recommend even every one to two weeks. So just make sure that there's not a lot of, uh, there's no mold accumulating um, and you're not seeing any birds that are acting uh, um, out of the ordinary. So scrub it with dish soap. You can put some bird feeders in your dishwasher. Uh, just double check what the instructions are when you get your bird feeder. Uh, you can ruin both your bird feeder and your dishwasher if you don't read the instructions. So you can also manually scrub them with dish soap uh, and then make sure you rinse it well. It's important to get all of that soap off to remove any chemicals from the bird feeder. Uh, another option is to soak it um, for about half an hour in a less than 10% non-chlorine bleach solution. So you can find non-chlorine bleach uh, at most stores um, and put in one cup of the bleach and then nine or 10 cups of water. So you have a good diluted mix of bleach. And then rinse it well, again, get all of those chemicals off the feeder and then air dry it. Make sure it is 100% dry before filling it. Otherwise the seeds at the bottom or near any moisture might get moldy and then birds might get sick. So make sure this is 100% dry before you fill it with seeds. And it's also very important to rake underneath your feeding area uh, so that those built up uh, seed shells are not uh, accumulating, gathering mold, and they can also attract unwanted visitors, chipmunks, squirrels, raccoons, bears even. Uh, so if you keep the feeding area uh, clean underneath the feeders, you're less likely to um, promote the growth of mold and attract unwanted visitors. So let's talk a little bit about placement. Uh, nearly one billion with a B 
birds die each year from flying into glass windows. Uh, this happens around our homes, even if we haven't put out bird feeders. But when we do put out bird feeders, we are attracting birds into our yards, closer to our glass windows. And so it's really important to make sure that our bird feeders are placed um, outside of this window strike zone. So keep your feeders either within three feet of your glass windows or beyond 10 feet. Anything between three and 10 feet um, uh, can kill a bird if it flies into the window. Beyond 10 feet, hopefully it will see the window, especially if you have uh, any bird decals uh, or things that reflect UV light that can help birds see your window. If, so if they're flying between three to 10 feet and they fly into your window, they might not see it in time and they've built up enough speed that they could break their neck when they hit your window. So to summarize, within three feet or beyond 10 feet and theoretically beyond eight to 10 feet is too far for squirrels to jump horizontally. But did you know some squirrels have jumped five feet vertically? So the higher, the better when it comes to squirrels. But squirrels are, they, they've evolved well to find food and seek out new challenges. They can also climb down and jump downward from a branch six feet uh, and land on your bird feeder. So these dimensions are a helpful guide. However, the squirrels in your neighborhood might be more highly evolved than this image portrays. So just be wary, and there's a couple other things out there that you can try. Uh, the first one is these things called baffles. Uh, these are built for squirrels, chipmunks, raccoons, and other mammals trying to access your bird seed. And they're a, some sort of covering that either goes below the bird feeder or above the bird feeder, and it prevents uh, the mammal from getting around that baffle and down to the seed. The other option is a spring. So some bird feeders come with a spring-loaded perch, and if the weight of the organism on top of the spring is too much, uh, the spring will compress uh, and then it will no longer become a perch. It will fold into the bird seed, into the bird feeder. So this is handy for squirrels. Um, it could also keep larger birds like pigeons or crows off of your bird feeder. Uh, but the chickadees and titmice um, weigh as much as two or three quarters uh, and they'll do just fine. So uh, there's some basic options you might see out there in your bird feeding stores. Um, I contend that no bird feeder is 100% squirrel proof. It might last for a decade before one wise squirrel eventually figures it out. Um, but you can do some simple things that will deter most squirrels. And if you can't deter them at all, maybe set up your own squirrel feeding station and that will keep them busy and away from the black oil sunflower seed. So all of this time we spent focusing on food and food is just one of the ways that we can attract birds to our yard. So I'll quickly summarize a couple others. Water. Uh, water is a very important resource for birds um, and like other uh, invertebrates, birds, mammals, including humans, uh, just by eating food, we're metabolizing water uh, through that process. But water is still an important, um, uh, it's important for bathing uh, and for drinking during the winter. And so if you can have some sort of water feature in your yard or if you live near a stream or a lake, um, kudos to you, you might see more bird diversity than just putting out food. The next one is shelter. Uh, so thinking about what sort of plants or habitat is around your yard or maybe over the fence in your neighbor's yard. Um, things like coniferous trees and bushes, so junipers and pine trees and spruce trees, things that hold on to their needles year round here in the Northeast. Um, these provide greater shelter than deciduous trees, things that are shedding their leaves during the winter and leaving their branches exposed. So other kinds of shelter there's coniferous trees, there's also brush piles or shrub piles uh, that you've created with during your fall cleanup. Uh, instead of taking it to the dump, just pile it in the corner of your yard or over the stone wall um, and it'll be a great shelter spot uh, for birds. The last one is roost sites. Uh, so during the summer, this fourth ingredient um, is nesting sites, but during the winter, few birds are nesting. And so what we can do is create roost sites or where birds are spending the night. Uh, if you have a nest box, just take off that front panel and turn it upside down. Birds will enter through the bottom. The heat from their bodies will get trapped <clears throat> at the top of the box and it'll keep it warmer uh, than the nest box, which would just let all the heat out uh, that entrance hole if it was right way up. 
So there's a simple roost site. If you have nest boxes already, just turn that um, front panel upside down. Now the four of these combined make birdscaping actions or landscaping for birds. So food, water, shelter, and roost sites, and you'll be well on your way to attracting birds to your yard during winter. Now for many of us, all the water is frozen during the middle of winter. So getting some sort of heated device, this could be um, uh, some sort of solar feature, or maybe it's plugged into your house and you have it on an extension cord, uh, or another type of heated bird bath to keep that water from freezing. Um, and if you don't have any mealworms out, your heated bird bath could attract things like bluebirds or maybe a late oriole or phoebe um, or larger woodpeckers that don't typically come into bird feeders. So you might get a huge pileated woodpecker uh, or maybe a northern flicker drop by your bird bath. Uh, warblers as well. If there happen to be any late warblers around, uh, they might be they would be more drawn to a heated bird bath uh, than any bird seed that is put out. So you're well on your way to feeding birds. You've attracted a great diversity of birds to your yards. The next thing that I like to do is share my sightings with others uh, to contribute to bird conservation. So we can help these birds um, uh, stick around for, for generations to come. Uh, they can continue to evolve as they, has been, as they have been for millions of years. So I'm gonna share with you three projects. Um, one is international, one is hemispheric, Western hemisphere. Uh, the other one is specific to New Hampshire, but for those of you out of state, uh, you may have more local projects with your local Audubons. So the first one up is Project Feeder Watch. This was started in 1987. It's currently run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Bird Studies Canada. So this is a really popular project uh, in the United States and Canada, uh, and I believe it's expanding southward into Central America. This project takes place November through April, so all winter long. It's already started this year, but you can still join. Uh, and the general purpose for this project is to survey birds coming to your feeders and the habitat in your yard. So generally speaking, um, if you sign up, I think it's $15, 20 for, for each year, you get a great packet that comes with a lot of great guides for how to identify common feeder birds for your area in the United States or Canada. Um, it's interested in what kinds of feeders you're using, what native plants you might have, any water features, and what kinds of food you're watching, uh, food you're putting out for birds. So the URL for this is feederwatch.org if you're interested in this project. The next project, specific to New Hampshire, it's run by New Hampshire Audubon, and this is the New Hampshire Backyard Winter Bird Survey. Uh, this year, it's taking place on February 12th and 13th, so it's one weekend, and the goal is to count birds and squirrels visiting your New Hampshire yard. So we love our birds. Some of us enjoy the squirrels as well, but the squirrels have a purpose uh, in this project. We want to know how are the red squirrel populations doing and how are the gray squirrel populations doing and can we link that to the changing climate or food availability. Uh, so this is a great local project and they produce some really uh, interesting and inspiring results. Uh, we can see from this graph of eastern bluebirds and American robins that winters are getting warmer. So both of these two species are what we consider to be half hardy. The vast majority of these populations migrate south out of New England for the winter, but a couple of the more hardy individuals stick around. And the number of those individual, individuals sticking around each winter has generally been increasing. I'm not exactly sure what's happening with the robin population here. This data could be influenced by the number of participants in the survey, uh, but clearly we can see that the eastern bluebird uh, is doing quite well during winters relative to what it was uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, so the website for this is nhbirdrecords.org slash backyard winter bird survey. Uh, sign up soon as the survey forms are mailed in mid-January. And one of my favorite projects to participate in is the Great Backyard Bird Count. Uh, this was the first bird science project I ever joined, uh, and I haven't missed a year since. 
So this one was founded in 1998. It's run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Audubon Society. This year it's taking place, I believe, President's Day weekend, which is February 18th through the 21st. Uh, this happens worldwide. And the goal is to count as many birds as possible, and those numbers contribute to a lot of uh, really exciting and important science taking place all over the world. Uh, so their motto is, how many birds can you find? You don't have to travel far, but you're welcome to. So this is not just for watching birds at home, but also uh, out and about. The website for that is birdcount.org. Um, and all you have to do, it's really easy to participate, is watch birds for 15 minutes in one location. Uh, you can do this anytime over that four days, and then report what you see. Uh, so maybe this uh, uh, thrasher will land on your on your foot <laughs> and you'll have something exciting to see or maybe if you're in Wisconsin or Michigan or northern New Hampshire you'll have to search a little bit harder uh, for something as interesting and all of the data is shared through eBird uh, there's the eBird app which is available on iPhones and Androids um, or on the computer you can just go to eBird.org to submit your sightings and there's much more instructions on how to participate at bird count uh, org. So from tonight's presentation, if you have to take away three things, here they are. First, offer quality seeds and other foods. Uh, we don't want to generate too much waste around our bird feeders, and we want to feed birds the best food available. So high in fat, high in protein, and we're avoiding those lesser preferred foods. Second, choose native plants. These provide shelter, uh, food, um, uh, and roost sites and nest sites during the breeding season. Um, so much preferred by native birds over invasive species or cultivars that we might have in our yard. So always choose native plants if we want to boost bird habitat. And as bird feeders, we are stewards of the bird world. It is our responsibility to make sure we're maintaining a safe feeding environment. So making sure we're cleaning our feeders regularly, um, avoiding harmful foods, making sure we're getting high quality foods uh, that don't include any aflatoxins or other molds, uh, things mixed in. And with that, let's turn it over to questions. This is, this is great. Thank you, Stephen. That was a fantastic presentation. This is the part in the presentation, if we were all in the same room, you would get an applause here. Um, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was terrific. Lots of great information. And I'm glad you left 15 minutes for questions because we have plenty of them. Um, uh, one thing that came up a couple of times uh, was feeding fruit. And I wonder if you might touch on that before I go through the rest of these questions. <laughs> Sure, so putting orange, half oranges out for Orioles in spring is, is popular for bird feeders. During winter, fruit is still an option. Um, it becomes a little more difficult for birds when the fruit is frozen, but it's not impossible for birds to eat it. So one thing you can do if it's not too, too cold, say above 20 degrees, uh, just heat up your raisins um, or oranges, um, uh, give them a little bit more moisture and then put them outside uh, and the birds might enjoy that. And there was a particular question about pears. Is that a good option for birds? <laughs> I'm not sure, actually. Um, I imagine that cedar waxwings, American robins, eastern bluebirds, other uh, frugivores, birds that like to eat fruit, might go for pear. Uh, make sure your pear is probably organic or you're peeling off um, the, the outside of the pear that might have toxins or chemicals on it. Uh, but yeah, I think pears should be fine. I haven't tried that one before. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go back to uh, the beginning of your presentation. And Pamela asked a question. Uh, we moved to a new home this year. It took less than one day for our two feeders to begin attracting birds. How does this happen? Do we have such terrific eyesight, outstanding sense of smell? Or are they simply watching each other? Like, how do they find these bird feeders so quickly? I'll just comment, one day is amazing. I've put out new feeders when I've moved to a new spot and it's taken weeks uh, for birds to find my bird feeders and that's normal. Um, during winter, some birds like chickadees will establish these foraging roots. Um, and if you happen to set up your bird feeder along their route and they've just been skipping over it, then they say, oh, there's something new there, food, they'll check it out. So it's possible that your new location happened to be in the spot that they were already moving through on a regular basis and they found it more easily. 
And is that by sight, smell, or are they just naturally curious? Typically by sight. So most songbirds are not good smellers. We leave that to the turkey vultures of the world. Um, so typically by sight. And if once one bird finds your bird feeder, other birds will be attracted to it. They'll say, oh, what's that bird doing over there? I should go check it out. Got it. Very cool. Um, Deborah asked, how do birds decide what to eat from all the little specks on the ground? And this goes back to the sense of smell. She says uh, that she sprinkles white millet and fine corn on the ground, but it seems that they only select a few seeds uh, to peck at. Yeah, good question. Um, well, it could be that uh, the, the white millet and corn is not their preferred foods. They might be looking for other things. Um, I don't know which species you have there. So what I'm saying might not be inaccurate. Okay, blue jays and cardinals, fantastic. Um, so they might be looking for larger food items. It's not worth them picking up the tiny morsels. Um, it's more energy expended for less energy gained. Um, I forgot the other thing I wanted to say, but maybe it'll come to me later. Okay. Um, Kathy was asking, and you touched on this a little bit about discouraging crows. Um, she doesn't want crows at her feeder. <laughs> How do we keep them away? Sure. So what you can do is get some sort of wire mesh um, and put it around your feeder or some feeders already come with this external wire grate so that only the small birds can access the bird feeder itself. Got it. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about food storage and there were a couple questions about that, um, specifically about suet. Uh, how per perishable is suet? How long can you keep that? It depends. So the high quality suet that you might get at a bird feeding store, uh, it's been rendered and it can last um, quite a long time. What I'll do is I'll put my suet in the freezer until I need it, and then I'll put it outside. Once it's outside, especially if you have a warm day or two warm days in a row, make sure it's not getting too sticky. We really want to avoid that with suet. Uh, the stickiness can stick to the bird's feathers and reduce the, the waterproofing of their feathers. So just make sure it's not going rancid or moldy or getting sticky. Uh, but other than that, keep it in your freezer, put it outside, and as long as it's staying hard and dry, you're good to go. Great. And while we're on the topic of suet, there was a question about this process of rendering. How do you do that? <laughs> so I've never attempted it myself, but there are instructions online. What you do is you melt the, the raw suet in a cast iron pan, scrape off the impurities from the top, and then repeat until nothing else is coming off the top. Um, once it's this pure liquid, um, set it aside to cool and harden, and then you can add in um, your mixtures to put outside. Got it. Um, so Brett asked, are hot pepper bird seeds bad? They're supposed to keep squirrels away. <laughs> yeah, these are not bad. Um, so hot pepper is an added ingredient, but it's a natural ingredient. And so if we think about how peppers evolved in the wild, um, they didn't want they only wanted their seeds to be spread by certain animals, a lot of the times birds. So birds don't have the heat uh, taste buds in their mouth that we mammals do. And so a lot of squirrels will avoid hot bird seed mixes, uh, but the birds can't really taste it. So that's fine for them. Very cool. Um, you did touch on mealworms. And actually, there was, a, there was an email that came in before the program about overfeeding birds. Is it possible that you're putting too much food out for the birds? Generally, no. Um, birds are much better than humans at um, controlling how much food we eat. Uh, they'll eat enough to survive, and they don't typically overeat. However, if you are putting out lots and lots of bird seed, um, make sure it's not getting moldy. If there's more bird seed out there, there's more nooks and crannies for moisture to accumulate. And so you may have to clean your feeders more regularly. And so depending on how often you want to clean your bird feeders, um, coming up with some sort of balance of how much food you're putting out. But no, birds generally don't overeat. <laughs> not too many ob obese birds out there. <laughs> no, <laughs> they get caught and eaten pretty quickly. So they've evolved to stay nice and trim. Gotcha. Uh, so discouraging some other animals here, um, Dave was asking about how to discourage house sparrows. 
That's a tricky one. Um, house sparrows have adapted to eat a lot of different kinds of food, so they're attracted to almost any kind of bird feeder. Uh, they're also roughly the same size as a lot of our preferred songbirds, so if you get a feeder that discourages crows, the house sparrows can still get in. Um, house sparrows do like that red uh, millet seed, whereas our native songbirds might prefer the white. So you can try changing up your food type. You can also try taking your bird feeders down for a while until the house sparrows forget about it and then put it back up. Um, if you live in an area with lots of house sparrows, it might be very, very difficult to get rid of them. So just enjoy them while you have them. Maybe count the ratio of male to females on different days. Find something to enjoy the house sparrows if, you, if you're forced to live with them. Got it. Yeah, they seem ubiquitous in urban areas, huh? Are they nationwide house sparrows? Except for some high peaks, yes. <laughs> oh, got it. Uh, another bird that um, Kelly's not too keen on are wild turkeys. She, I guess she's got wild turkeys that come to her feeder. Are, are there ways to keep them away? Uh, well, that's a big bird and they can fly. So even if you put up a fence, they could still get over the fence. That's a tricky one. Um, they, even if you put your bird feeders higher, they can still access seed that's fallen underneath. Um, so if you have dogs, letting them run around the yard could help. Um, but that's another hard one to keep away. Got it. Um, Dave was wondering about mealworms. Uh, he said, I heard feeding mealworms to bluebirds contributes to calcium deficiency. Is that true? Have you heard that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know more about this. Um, if I had to speculate, a lot of uh, arthropods and other insects similar to mealworms have calcium in their shell, but it's possible that mealworms have less calcium uh, than insects found um, in the wild and less homegrown things like mealworms. So it's possible. Uh, I'd love to read more about it. Got it. Might need to follow up on that one. Um, Conrad was asking about other types of nuts. You, you mentioned peanuts. Are there other types of nuts that we can feed the birds? Birds will eat other kinds of nuts. Uh, they might not be preferred and always be careful about getting salted nuts. So if you want to experiment, experiment with just a little and make sure they're unsalted uh, without any added ingredients or glazes, things like that. All right, and now Dennis touched on the number one pest. Um, how do we keep bears away from the feeder? And you mentioned that kind of <laughs> that area when we can feed them, but uh, I know that bears have been seen in Hancock as recently as yesterday roaming around. So, yeah. So as winters are getting warmer, um, bears are out later than December 1st and earlier than April 1st. And if there's a warm spell, they might just pop out of hibernation, grab a quick meal and go back to hibernating. So it is tricky. Um, if you really want to avoid bears, put your feeders out in the heart of winter. Hope for no warm spells. Um, and bears are less common in more urban settings. Uh, if we live out in the rural woods or even in some suburban areas, um, bears can be an issue. And so we don't want to attract bears into places where they might cause wildlife human conflicts. We want to avoid those situations. So again, just being a good steward for more than birds, but wildlife in general. Got it. Yeah, thanks for that. And you did touch on um, address it, yeah, window strikes. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more because I get lots of phone calls at the Harris Center about preventing birds from hitting windows. And you talked about the spacing. Are there is there anything else we can do to our windows to help uh, birds see them better or to avoid them? Yes, fantastic question. Um, I know we only have three minutes left, but <laughs> yeah. the American Bird Conservancy has a number of web pages dedicated specifically to reducing window collisions among birds. Um, the number one thing to do is reduce the reflectivity of your window. Um, so if you have a, a big, large pane glass window, uh, drawing the shades or, or putting some sort of coating or hanging strings, making that window much more visible to birds. So they're not seeing straight through it to your house plants and they say, oh, I could go perch there. Um, and then they fly into the window. So reducing the reflectivity of a window, uh, turning off uh, lights when it's nighttime, especially during migration, that's less important 
winter and summer. Um, and again, yeah, making sure that your feeders are not in that danger zone of three to 10 feet from your window. Got it. Thanks so much for that. As you mentioned, we're, we're running a little bit low on time. We still have plenty of questions here. Um, why don't we end on, would you endorse the Wild Birds Unlimited? There was a, a lot of chatter about Wild Birds Unlimited in the, in the chat <laughs> and, uh, as a source of seed. And I guess the feeders, um, are, is that a good spot to shop from? Yes. There might be exceptions for some of their products. And I'm not a spokesperson for Wild Birds Unlimited. But um, when I ran Antioch Bird Club at Antioch University, that's where we got a lot of our bird seed and a lot of our bird feeders. Um, so just be careful if you see them starting to break down over time from natural wear and tear and blue jays hammering on the side, um, maybe think about replacing those feeders. But fantastic store to start out at. All right, there you have it. Thank you for <laughs> taking all those questions. We had a couple more, but uh, we'll have to have another session. There was a request for um, a birdhouse making uh, talk, maybe sometime in the future. So uh, we'll we'll put that in our in our a pin in our hat for that one. Maybe revisit that. And thanks again, Stephen. And thanks to everyone for joining us on this chilly night. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Have a good night, all. Enjoy the birds.